Hello and welcome to another tutorial for uh, Math 115. So in today's tutorial we're going to talk about determinants of 3x3 three three or higher matrices and then we're going to talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So let's begin. So this week we have a rapid fire evaluate survey. So please pause the video and take just a minute to go to evaluate.uwaterloo.cdca to fill out the evaluate survey. These surveys are quite important for us making tweaks to our own personal teaching styles and for uh, making potential changes to the course as well. So yeah, I know I've definitely used Evaluate Feedback to improve my teaching style and I will continue to do so. And if you don't want to do it for me, please do it for SpongeBob. So in here, everything's drawn in R2. Up here, everything's drawn in R3. So leaving the water is a some type of transform from R2 to R3. Realistically, this would not be a linear transform, but it is a transform nevertheless. So let's look at our first example. Okay. For this matrix, it's a three by three square matrix with these entries. We want to compute the determinant of A, the adjugate of A, and use our work to compute the inverse of A. Okay, so how do we go about computing the determinant? Well, the answer is we're going to do a cofactor expansion along some row or some column. Here, I say I want to do it along the last row. Uh, in general, you can do it along any row that you would ever want to do or any column that you would ever want to choose. Here, why do I pick the last row? Well, if I look at the last row, I have a one and two zeros. Well, I don't really care about the negative one. It's the two zeros are the reason why I want to pick this last row. The reason being, if I have a zero here, I don't have to compute another determinant. So if you kind of go back, you could also do this row and get that, or this column and get that same benefit, but you don't get that benefit if you use any other rows or columns. Again, you could do it. You could expand along this column. It's just not going to be the nicest experience compared to the bottom row. Okay, so how do I do this cofactor expansion? Well, I'll say the determinant of this will be equal to something. Well, in these cofactor expansions, I have a choice between a positive one or a negative one. I say a choice, it's not really a choice. Depending on where the uh, coefficient's coming from, you are forced to pick positive one or negative one. So how do I pick which one? Well, in general, if you had a one by one matrix, it's just gonna be a positive. If it's different, you'll follow this pattern here where you just alternate between positive and negative. So for a three by three, what we're computing here, I would use this pattern. Negative here, positive here, negative here, and a positive here. In the, for in the text, there's that formula negative one to the i plus j. You could use this as well. It just gives you the exact same matrix. It's just up to you which one you wanna use. Generally speaking, I find it easier just to look at the matrix and go, oh, I want this term, positive, negative, positive, therefore a plus, but that's personal preference. Okay, so now if I do this cofactor expansion on the bottom, I'm going to get this term of plus or negative one multiplied by the term multiplied by a determinant. So the term in this case for the first term would just be this piece here, right? How do I find the determinant? Well, I want the determinant of ignore this column, ignore this row, because that's where my term is from, the resulting stuff here. So the first term that I get here would simply be negative, or sorry, positive one from this times negative one from this times the determinant of that, and that's coming from this matrix here. Okay, now just for demonstrative purposes, let's figure out how to do it for the zero term and the other zero term. They could be non-zero in theory, so let's just write this out for completion. So this zero is in a negative position. Since it's in a negative position, I will take the zero and multiply it by negative one, and then I'd multiply it by a determinant. What determinant? Well, I would ignore this row and this column, and it'd just be one, three, negative one, two. Okay, and I repeat the same process here. So I'm now in a plus position again, so from here, it's going to be plus one times zero times a determinant, and that determinant will be this matrix here. Okay, and it kind of runs off the slides, but yeah. Okay, so from here, you can notice, hey, since these two terms were zero, that is gone, and this is gone. 
That means I don't actually have to compute these determinants. That's kind of nice. So here I can simply say this is just this determinant here. And if I evaluate that determinant, I get this or just negative 4. So just a note on the computational complexity of this. If I had a 4x4 four four matrix, so if I put four numbers here, 3, 4, duh, 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 and fill in these dots, if I had something like this, if I go to try to do a cofactor expansion, if I do a cofactor expansion along, say, this row here, first I would take this thing times a positive times the determinant of the matrix with this stuff here. That's a 3 by 3 determinant. And I'd have a 3 by 3 determinant for each one of these elements here. So I would have to compute four 3 by 3 determinants. Okay, that gets a little tedious really fast because for each one of these, I also have to compute three 2 by 2 determinants. So that's 12 uh, determinants down here and four determinants up here. That's a lot of determinants. But on the other hand, if we can manage to introduce zeros, we can reduce this number to simply computing one 3 by 3 determinant, which then each needs three 2 by 2 determinants, but there's only one of the 3 by 3s. And we'll talk about that on the next example. So, okay, now we've computed the determinant. Let's compute this adjugate. So how do I compute an adjugate? Well, I basically build this matrix formed of the cofactors. The cofactors are the plus or minus uh, in addition to these matrices here, and I take the transpose of that. So the first term will be plus because it's up at this top bit here, and it's going to be uh, ignoring this column and this row, and I would simply take the determinant of this. So the first term is plus the determinant of that. The next term will be a minus because I'm now in this area. So I'll get negative times a determinant while I ignore this col a row in this column, and it'll be the determinant of this matrix with these entries here. So just that. Then I'm back up in plus world. So since I'm in a plus location, I ignore this and this, and I get plus that determinant. And I just repeat this. So negative, here I ignore this and this, so I take those components. Here I'm at positive again, so I ignore this and this, so those four components. Here I'm negative again, ignore this and this, those four components. Here I'm positive, ignore this and this, those components. Here I'm negative, ignore this and this, those components. And finally, here I'm positive, ignore these two, those components. And don't forget the transpose. Okay, so generally speaking, I highly recommend writing down this uh, matrix of this form here for say a uh, assignment or on the final, just because if you were to simply compute this out and put numbers here, if you mess up a number, I don't know if you had the right matrix here or not. So that doesn't really give much room for giving partial credit. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so from here, I just compute the determinants of all of these two by twos. So here, just kind of really briefly, here I have a row of zeros, so that's what will be zero. Here, it'll just be negative times this thing, so that. Here I have a row of zeros, so just zero. Here I have a row of zeros, so zero. I'll leave the negative out front just to kind of drag these along a little bit longer. Here, I just take this times this with a negative, so I get that. Here, I just take negative times negative this times this to get this. Here, I take positive that times that, so this. Here I take negative this minus that, so I get this. And here I just take negative that times that, get that. Okay, so here I have all of these things transposed and I could just clean these up. That's what those numbers simplify to be. And now we know how to take transposes, so that is the adjugate. Okay, so the issue that we had before with computing ter terminants for big matrices becomes even worse here. If this was a four by four matrix, each one of these would be a three by three matrix that I have to compute the determinant of. So I have nine three by three determinants to compute. And for each of those three by three determinants, I need to compute three determinants of a two by two matrix. So net 27 two by two determinants are required to be calculated to compute this. And in general, this would just keep scaling worse and worse and worse. Okay. So all of that said, let's use this information to now find the inverse. Well, how can I use this information? 
Well, thankfully, we have a nifty difty formula. I know that the inverse of a is simply going to be 1 over the determinant of a times the adjugate of a. So here, that's 1 over the determinant. This is the adjugate. I know how to do scalar multiplication. Therefore, this simplifies to this statement here. Okay, so all the hard work of finding an inverse is really in finding this determinant and this adjugate. Okay, so this kind of begs the question. We have multiple ways that we can compute inverses, right? If I give you a matrix A, you could go through and you could do this thing where you augment it with the identity matrix and you could row reduce this to I and A inverse, assuming A inverse exists. So you could do this. Alternatively, you could simply, quote, simply, compute the determinant of A and you can compute the adjugate of A. Okay, so for both of these cases, you need to compute determinants of big matrices, potentially. So generally speaking, if you're dealing with a two by two, the determinant is really easy to compute and the adjugate is really easy to compute. So if I call this method one and this method two, for a two by two, method two is pretty much the best method. For a three by three, it kind of breaks down to personal preference a little bit. So here, it, there's a fair bit of work to do here potentially. And in practice, if you're doing it by hand, which you should be doing for this course, uh, the algebra could get kind of tedious depending on exactly what you're working with. So here, two, one might not be a bad method, but for two to compute the determinant, you need to compute the determinant of three two by twos. And to compute the adjugate, you need to compute the determinant of nine two by twos. So here it's kind of a toss up between is one better or is two better. So one versus two is a bit of a toss up. But if you start getting into four by fours or higher, so four by fours or bigger, then ultimately one starts to become preferable if you're doing it by hand. That said, if you're doing a, a, a 9,000 by 9,000 matrix by hand, you're doing something wrong. So yeah, so just kind of keep this in mind for strategies of determining how you want to compute the determinant. Okay, let's go on to or the inverse. Okay, so let's now go on to computing the determinant of this thing. Here, as I said before, oops, here, as I said before, you don't always have a bunch of zeros. This very clearly doesn't have a bunch of zeros. So I would be forced to compute three two by two determinants if I just did an expansion along here. While you can do that, that would be a bit tedious. So instead of doing that, let's introduce zeros by using elementary row operations. We notice that we could do this when we were trying to solve a system of equations, right? Like if I had a ax is equal to b, I would put my a matrix and my b matrix, and I do row operations to turn this into i times, say, c, where c is the solution. Okay, so we could introduce zeros here, but the natural question is, if we introduce those zeros, how does it change the determinant? So that's what we'll talk about here, so solution. We're going to use EROs to form a column or row with only one non-zero entry. You can do this with any column or any row. I am going to choose to do it with this column or this row here, okay? So this thing is two, this is six, that's four. If they're all divisible by two, I can divide them by two. Let's do it this way. You can notice that you could also do it here. And ultimately that's kind of, well, they're, they're equivalent, but it's a little bit nicer or cleaner if you do it with the top row, if you want to have the one in the top. But to show you how swapping works, I'm choosing to do it here. So this is a choice for educational purposes. Okay, so the determinant of this, well, usually when I did this ERO things, I always wanted to have a one with a bunch of zeros in the top column, right? And then I wanted to get ones over here and so forth. So you might wanna say, hey, I'm going to turn this into a one. Why not just put it into the top column? Can I do that? Yes, you just swap the two rows. How does that change the determinant? Well, when you swap any two rows, you generate a negative. So one way of kind of thinking for why this would be the case is if you think back to those permutation matrices we talked about previously. Well, if I build a permutation matrix that say swaps say row one with row two, I could use this matrix to go from this to this. How could I do it? Well, this matrix was A. If I call this matrix B, here I would have B 
is equal to p times a, right? So here, if I take the determinant of both sides, the product of the determinants is the determinant of the products. So here, I could split this up like this. The determinant of this is just negative 1. Why? Well, if I give you an arbitrary permutation matrix, you can show that if it only swaps two things, its determinant is negative 1. So from here, this, I still have my a here. So from here, this implies that my a, or determinant of a, will simply be negative the determinant of b. Okay, That's kind of a rough one way that you can remember this fact and why it would be true. Okay, so let's go on. Now I have this row of twos. I want to make them a one. How do I do that? Well, the simple way is I divide by one half. So if I do this, does that change the determinant? Well, let's just think about this for a second. My original determinant that I was computing is just two, six, four, and some stuff. It doesn't matter what the stuff is here. Okay, so if I, oops. So if I wanted to compute the determinant here, I would end up with something that's like two times the determinant of something oops, minus six times the determinant of something plus four times the determinant of something. Okay, so if I did this same process, but with the result after I divided by two, I'd have a one, a three, and a two. I'd have other stuff here. So here, this determinant would be one times the determinant of something, but this something Crucially, this something is the same as this something because it doesn't didn't change, right? So I continue, I'd get negative 3 and a ne uh, positive 4 times the determinant of something. And that something would precisely be this something is this something and this something is this something. So had a typo here, this 4 should be a 2. So if you look at it, this determinant is twice the size of this determinant because all I did was divide this row by two. So the rule is going to be, if I divide by two, I have to multiply by two. Generally speaking, if you multiply by any arbitrary scalar, you have to divide by that same scalar precisely for the reason kind of outlined, oops, precisely for the reason kind of outlined here with this problem here between the top one and the bottom one. Okay, so from here, I get that. Next, if I want to do the row operations to get rid of the 5 and the 10, I would simply have to compute this row operation here. So does this change the determinant? Turns out that the answer is no. So the determinant is only changed when you swap or when you scale a row. So here I'm scaling R1, but R1 is not the row that I'm replacing. So if I were to replace, say, row 1 with this, I would have to divide by negative 5, but since I'm replacing R2 with this, I don't have to do anything. So from here, if I do those row operations, that's what I get for these terms with the negative 2 out front. So now I can simply compute the determinant. Okay, What row should I expand on or what column should I expand on? Well, this is the row that I, or the column that I did all this work to get the zeros. Let's expand on it. So since these two terms are zeros, I don't have to look at the determinants bits there. So I'll just get a plus coming from the position times a 1, coming from that number here, multiplied by the determinant of this stuff here. So if I put it in slides, it's just negative 2, so the thing out front, times 1 times 1, that's just 1, times the determinant of this stuff remaining here, well, that's just this. Now this is a 2 by 2 determinant. That, by definition, is this times this minus that times that. And that simply simplifies to this if you just do the multiplication or that after you add them together. Okay, so in general, if you are asked to compute the determinant of a three by three or n by n matrix, where you have a bunch of terms that aren't zero, it's in your interest to force zeros. Again, as I mentioned before, for a three by three, since computing two by two determinants is pretty quick, it doesn't save that much work, but if it was a four by four, again, you would end up saving having to do three three by three determinants and instead would only have to do the remaining one determinant that survives uh, this process here. Okay, so let's go on to another example. Let A, B, and C be n by n matrices of real numbers such that determinant of A is 2, determinant of B is pi, determinant of C is negative 3, 
And further, let's introduce a new matrix D, and this is going to be some invertible matrix that's an n, n by n matrix of real numbers. So for all of this information, I'm asking you to compute this determinant here. Yep. So kind of the educational reason of doing this is it allows us to explore how I can simplify expressions like this, uh, and that is a very useful tool to have in your disposal for when you want to try to do, say, proofs for th various things. Okay. So if you can simplify these type things, you could use this to help prove some statements that involve determinants or maybe invertible matrices. Okay, so how can I solve this? Well, I need some rules. The first rule I'm going to apply is that the determinant of a product, and I've already used this, but the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. So from here, this rule applies for two matrices A and B, but it also can be replied repeatedly. So using this repeatedly, I can split up a big product like this. So 3D squared, that's a matrix. So determinant of 3D squared times the determinant of everything that's remaining. But the stuff that's remaining is again a product. So I could pull off this A cubed. So I could say, oh, that's times A cubed. And again, that's times the rest of this. And I could say, oh, I can pull off the B. I can pull off the C transpose and I can pull off this matrix here. Okay, that's fair enough. Next here, if I look at this 3D squared, that is of the form of the determinant of some scalar times some matrix. So I need to know how to pull this out. So it turns out that if A is an n by n matrix, I can pull out a k to the n determinant of A. Okay, so why do I need the n? Well, let's just briefly look at one example. This is not a proof. This is just a justification for this. So if I look at the identity matrix, where this is, say, a two by two identity matrix. So let's just be more concrete. If I look at this matrix here, okay, the determinant of this is just one. Now, if I multiply this by K, how does this change the determinant? Well, this is just k, 0, 0, k, determinant of that. This is k squared. So at a minimum, pulling out k isn't going to be sufficient, right? I'm going to have to pull out k squared for this case. And it turns out that in general, this is true, basically for the same idea that's happening here. OK, so if I want to pull out the 3, I need to pull out a 3 to the k, or to the n. So here I get 3 to the n, determinant of d squared. So here, determinant of a cubed, well, to be explicit here, I could say determinant of a cubed. This thing is just the determinant of a times a squared. Then I can use this rule to say, oh, that's determinant of a, which I'm going to start writing like this, times the determinant of a squared. But a squared is a times a, so I can split this up into a times a, well, the determinants of those. Okay, so in general, I can pull out exponents, essentially. So from here, determinant of a cubed is just determinant of a quantity cubed. Determinant of b, that's the same thing. Okay, so now what about the determinant of c transpose? How would the transpose change things? Well, if you notice, just kind of hand-waving, uh, if, I, if this was a 3 by 3 just for the purposes of getting an idea for why the statement I'm going to say is true, but if this is a 3 by 3, if you take the transpose of this matrix, it's the same thing as what I started with, right? So if I take the transpose of stuff, the process that I would go through via this cofactor expansion, the signs don't change, and relatively relative to each other, the positions of the numbers don't change. So this is kind of a very hand-wavy argument that the determinant of a transpose is just the determinant of the number. Okay, so this is a true statement. This is not a proof. It's just kind of hand-waving why we think it might be true. Okay, so next we have this determinant uh, of d inverse squared. Well, so here I could simplify this out a bit by saying, hey, this is just some matrix squared, so I could do that. Okay, one more pass through. 3 to the n stays as 3 to the n, determinant of d squared, pull it out. These terms stay the same, so dot, 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 
determinant of the inverse, well, DET of an inverse of a matrix, assuming it exists, of course, is one over the determinant of that matrix. Okay, so here, this is one over D, uh, one over the determinant of D, quantity squared, or this. Okay, so now I just use this information to plug it in. So here's a determinant here, here's this, let's combine them together. You could cancel at this point, but just to demonstrate a bit more. So here, if I take this determinant of A is two, plug that in, I get this, B is pi, determinant of C is negative three, I get this, and just doing some algebra, these cancel, two cubed times negative three gives me the negative 24, and I just get this. Okay. So that's how to use properties of determinants to compute something like this. Okay, next up, polynomial interpolation. So find the unique third degree polynomial that goes through these points. Well, if I want to do this, I first need to start with a third degree polynomial. That is what a third degree polynomial looks like. Okay, so since I have a third degree polynomial that looks like this, the next question is, what does it mean for this polynomial to go through a point? Well, this thing will go through a point if and only if, if I plug in the x value, out comes the y value. Oops, one. So from here, uh, I need the following things to hold. I need p of one, or p of negative one to be one, which gives me this equation, right? Just plug in negative one. I need p of zero to be one, so that equation. I need p of one to be five, this equation. And I need p of two to be negative one, this equation. So we can, of course, clean this up by simplifying these terms out and writing it in our nice little clean format. Okay, so just a brief mention of the usefulness of this. So in general, in a uh, electronic screen, you have a bunch of pixels. So a natural thing you might want to do is to take a picture that's lower resolution and to blow it up. So within each one of these squares, you have three values. You have a R, a G, and a B value. So red, green, and blue. And when you put these little lines together, the colors blend and you get a nice little screen. Okay, so let's suppose I have an image where I know the colors, the values of these RGB uh, terms in each of these dots, but I do not know it in the ones that I didn't fill in. Well, it'd be very bad if I had a screen that if I took a low res picture and tried to blow it up a bit, if I had these big blank spots where it was just black where these uh, white squares are. So instead, what we can do is we can approximate what color should go here. So what color should go here? Well, the way I can do it is I can take a polynomial. It won't be a polynomial that looks like this because it'll also involve y terms. So it'd be a polynomial for x and y. You can define that. We don't need it here explicitly. But you can define a polynomial and you could ask, hey, I want a polynomial of this order or this degree that has the properties that it satisfies this red value for here, the red value for here, the red value for here, the red value for here. I can do that interpolation and then I could say, hey, take that polynomial and compute it at this point x and y, where x and y are just gonna be the number of pixels, so the row column stuff. So I can use that to fill in these pixels here and your device does that on a regular basis. Typically they'll use cubic, so uh, third degree polynomials or linear, those are two, op two options. Okay, so that as an aside, let's talk about how I can go from here to computing the coefficients. Well, to do that, I need to solve this thing. Well, just review for the final. Remember, that's the same thing as this matrix system, right? Just the coefficient matrix here and my vector over here. And this can be solved, or equivalently, this can be solved by simply row reducing coefficient matrix augmented with vector. So if I do that, this is my result. And from here, I could just read off, hey, that's A3, this is A2, this is A1, and this is A0. So from there, I can read off the coefficients to get this polynomial. So that's all there really is to this application, but it is quite useful for doing things like this or a lot of things in data. So if you have incomplete data and you wanna know what happens in the middle, you can do interpolation to get a good approximation. Okay, let's go on to our next topic. So consider some unknown but smooth smoothness is to throw out fractals, closed shape in R2 with an area of 4.2. Okay, so from here I could say, hey, I'm transforming this shape by uh, some linear transform L with this standard matrix. And from here I could ask, what is the area of the new shape? 
So let's just suppose I have some original shape over here, say this guy here, and I do some linear transform. So actually to be explicit, I'm going to take this, I'm going to bring it over here, and I am going to rotate it by uh, a vertical flip, and let's do a 90 degree rotation. Okay, there we go. So I do this transform like this. Okay, so suppose I knew what the original area was. I know what the red is, and I now want to know what the green is over here. Well, how can I do this? Well, it turns out that this determinant, the determinant of this matrix T, if I put this in absolute value, so A, B, S of this, this tells me the factor upon which space is expanding or being scaled by. To kind of get a better idea of this as a proof, you really want eigenvalues, which we have on the next slide. So I'll talk briefly about that when we get to that point. But the factor which area is scaled by is just this. So this is a simple problem. The area of the new shape will be simply 2.2, the old area, so the old area, multiplied by the absolute value of the determinant of t. So just compute the determinant. That's straightforward. This minus this. I get negative 7. Take its absolute value, multiply it by 4.2. We're done. OK. So computing eigenvalues, eigenvectors. So here I want you to find the eigenvalues and a corresponding eigenvector for this. And for each eigenvalue, I want a basis for the eigenspace. And I want to know the algebraic and geometric multiplicities of each of these eigenvalues. OK. So how do I go about doing this? Well, let's just talk about eigenvalues, eigenvectors for a second. So here, if I have an equation ax is equal to lambda x, we call the x's the eigenvectors, and we call the lambdas the eigenvalues. So you've seen this before. We talked about uh, the stochastic matrices multiplied by a vector x equaling x. And the solutions to this we called steady state vectors to that uh, system, right, to the Markov chain. So we've done this before in the case where lambda was 1. So we kind of know where they can be useful for some contexts. But it turns out that this is useful for a lot of contexts. Next week, we'll talk about diagonalization. And when doing diagonalization, a natural way to do it is to know what the eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. If they're sufficiently nice, you can diagonalize the matrix. We'll talk about that a bit next term. The next thing you can notice is, hey, if I have a bunch of these uh, vectors, say v1 up to, say, vn, and if these things are eigenvectors of A, and if these form a basis for, say, Rn, where Rn is the domain of the linear transform that corresponds to the matrix A, then simply multiplying by a multiplying a by a vector simply becomes scaling things. To be concrete, if v1 and v2 are eigenvalues for a matrix A, and if uh, the domain here is R2, then then if these things are also a basis for R2, then we can go and say, hey, if x is in R2 then x can be written as a linear combination of v1 and v2. And then from this linear combination, if I want to compute a times x, this is simply, well, a times this thing here, c1, I'll just copy it, this, with parentheses around here. So this is simply this. But then by the linearity of A, I can simplify this out to say, hey, C1, A, V1, plus C2, A, V2. And from here, I know that A, V1 and A, V2, that is simply going to be my lambda 1, V1, and lambda 2, V2, where lambdas are my eigenvalues. So from here, I can rewrite this as C1, lambda 1, V1, plus C2, lambda 2, V2. Two. Okay, so matrix multiplication simply becomes this nice clean scaling, and this in turn means that A can be written in a diagonal form. So we'll talk more about that in the next tutorial, but that's why we care about this. So the question now is, if A times X is equal to lambda X, how can I find solutions to this?
Well, trivially, if x is 0, if this thing is 0 here, I get the 0 vector on this side and the 0 vector on this side. So 0 always will be a solution, but I can't use 0 for most of the purposes, right? Like, if I wanted to do the thing earlier where I get a basis of eigenvectors, I cannot do that with the 0 vector because it won't be linearly independent. So we throw out the 0 vector. Now, if x is not equal to 0, I want to solve this for x. So the first thing I can do is just try to collect x all on one side of an equation. So I can subtract off this. I will write an i here just because i times x is equal to x, and this is useful for the next step. So just subtracting this off and rewriting x as i times x. Now, if I want to kind of isolate from here, both of these have an x in this position, so I can just factor it out of the right-hand side. And by right-hand side, I mean right-hand side of this thing here, like that. Okay, so now I want to find solutions to this. In particular, I want to find solutions where x is not 0. Okay, well this thing just looks like, if I go over here, that looks like b times x is equal to 0. Where b, if you want to be ex exact, is that a minus lambda i thing, right? So b is just this thing, but it looks like this, right? Let's do a thought experiment. What if b inverse exists? Well, if b inverse exists, I could say this is b inverse times bx is equal to b inverse times 0. Okay, So from here, I could rewrite this. This is b inverse b times x is equal to just 0. And over here, this is the identity matrix, right? So this just tells me x is equal to 0. Uh-oh, if b inverse exists, there's only one unique solution, that is x is equal to 0. Thus, if I want to go back over here, if I want to have a non-trivial solution, I need this thing, the determinant of it, to not be 0. So explicitly, if x is not equal to 0, we need this determinant, so the determinant of a minus lambda i, to be equal to 0, right? If the determinant is 0, it's non-invertible. Well, it's non-invertible if and only if the determinant is 0, and I want this thing to be non-invertible, so I need this to be true. Okay, so from here, I give this side of the equation a name. I call this the char characteristic polynomial of a. Why polynomial? Well, it turns out this will always be a polynomial. Okay, so if I find the zeros of this polynomial, I can figure out what lambda is. So if I draw my little, make this bigger, if I draw a little arrow and clean this up like this, so this thing, if I solve it for the lambdas, I can get lambda is equal to lambda 1 up to maybe lambda k. Okay, so now that I have these lambdas, I have my eigenvalues, I still need to find the eigenvectors. Well, how can I do this? Well, here I can just plug these into this expression. And if I do this, I get a minus lambda i times i times x needs to be equal to zero, the zero vector. Well, this is the exact same thing as saying x is in the null space of this matrix a minus lambda i times i. So for completion, I should put a, or for, to be more exact, I should call that x1. Okay, so if I want to find the eigenvalues, eigenvectors, all I have to do is simply solve, well, find this characteristic polynomial by computing a determinant, find the zeros, which can be an issue in and of itself, and once I get the zeros, I just need to compute this null space. So to elaborate on the issue with finding the zeros, if you have a fifth degree polynomial or higher, there is a proof that you are not necessarily able to find the zeros. There is no uh, formula that you can plug, uh, that you can use to find the zeros of a fifth degree polynomial or higher, generally speaking. Some of them you can solve, but not all of them. Okay, so. Let's apply this method over here to actually solve this problem. 
Okay, so solution. First, we find the characteristic polynomial. That's my c sub a of lambda, which I just called p of lambda in my uh, slides. So from here, that's this determinant. Well, how do I compute this determinant? Well, that's just this thing minus lambda times i. So that's just lambdas on the diagonal, zeros everywhere else, right? So if I do that, I just get these lambdas being subtracted on the diagonals. Okay, so if I go to compute this determinant, well, I need to expand along something. This looks rather nice because I have zeros. So you could do some row reduction steps here to simplify it a little bit to make it easier, but do keep in mind that if you do uh, uh, elementary row operations, do not divide by any function of lambda. You don't know what lambda is, so this could be zero. So just a word of caution if you take that path for some problems. Okay, so here I don't have to do anything fancy. I can just do this expansion. So this is in a plus position. So it'll simply be plus this thing times this determinant here. So this times this. Okay, now this determinant in turn is just that minus this. That is straightforward to compute. So this is just this thing squared times that. Pretty straightforward. What are the roots? Well, if lambda is negative one or if lambda is two, I get a root of the polynomial. That means, well, here I found my c sub a. So I've done this step here, check. I have now solved it so I know what my eigenvalues are. It's just simply these roots. So those are my eigenvalues. Okay. Now we're at a really good spot to talk about what the algebraic multiplicity is. Well, the algebraic multiplicity is simply the number of times that one of the eigenvalues is a root of the characteristic polynomial. So if you look here, negative one is a root how many times? two times. So the algebraic multiplicity negative one is going to be two. So the algebraic multiplicity negative two is, well, negative two is a root one time. So this is just going to be one. Okay, so the importance of this is tied to several theorems for diagonalization and other things. So it's very useful uh, because of those theorems and many applications need the algebraic multiplicity to be able to prove you can do something. Okay, so that's why we care. So here I've now find, found my eigenvalues. My next step in this kind of uh, process is to solve this equation, which means I need to find this null space. Okay, before I explicitly do the null space, let's just notice something interesting. So this thing was given by this expression here, right? So I can simply notice that the determinant of a, so this determinant here, is exactly p of zero. So all that's really happening here is if I plug in lambda is equal to zero, I get p of zero is equal to the determinant of zero. So for this particular case, this is equal to negative two, which is also the same thing as negative one squared times negative two. So to see why from here, if you go back here, this, if I just plug in lambda is equal to zero, I get negative one squared times negative two. But this is just the product of the eigenvalues, including the number of times it is an eigenvalue. So the product of the eigenvalues is the determinant of A. This is true for all matrices A. This is very useful for a lot of geometric applications. For instance, the thing with the scaling, we'll talk in the next example about how this relates to the scaling, but this is important for a lot of topics. And you can also use this to explicitly help compute determinants and to do, yeah, you could use this definition. Okay, so to find the eigenvectors associated with the eigenvalue of negative one, I thus now compute this null space. Well, plug in negative one. So here it's just a of one minus negative this thing. So from here, if I wanna do this, I just add one to the diagonals, right? negative negative one is positive one. So I want to row reduce this to find the null space. So we all know how to find the null space. So to keep the video a little bit shorter here, we row reduce it to get this. This column has a free parameter, let's call it T. So from here, how many free parameters? One, again, this guy. And we simply say that the null space of this is simply going to be the things of the form negative T coming from here, T coming from the second column being a free parameter and zero, coming from here.
This we can rewrite as the span of this single vector here. Okay, so a basis for the null space is simply the collect the set that contains only this vector. Therefore, a basis for the eigenspace for negative 1 is going to be this. That's purely because the eigenspace for negative 1 is this null space. Okay, so from here, if I want an eigenvalue, I can pick anything in this null space, anything in the eigenspace, other than the zero vector, right? We're just kind of borrowing the zero vector so we can be a space. So from here, this vector is going to be an eigenvector for minus 1. So we can actually verify this. How can we verify this? Well, we can take my matrix A, and if we take this matrix and we multiply it by this vector, so uh, minus 1, 1, 0, if, and it turns out to be the case, if this is equal to minus 1 times minus 1, 1, 0, then this is in fact the eigenvector, and this is in fact the eigenvalue. Well, an eigenvector corresponding to this eigenvalue, first bit. So, yeah, so definitely do this to keep, no, definitely keep this in mind, and I do highly recommend doing that to check your solutions. Okay, so finally, I want to know what the geometric multiplicity is. Well, the geometric multiplicity is simply the number of elements in a basis for the eigenspace. There's one vector here, therefore the geometric multiplicity is one, since only one element in the basis. Okay, so this was doing all of this for lambda is equal to negative one. I repeat the process for lambda is equal to negative 2. So all I do is the same thing, but I replace lambda with negative 2. So I get this. So here I'm adding 2 on the diagonal. So if I do this, I end up with a 1, 0, 1 on the diagonal. Nothing else changes. I row reduce. So here, how many free parameters? Well, 1 corresponding to this thing here. So here, if I associate that with t, I get 0. 1 is equal to like this from here, t from the middle term, and 0 here. So the null space is all vectors of this form. Okay, so from here I can say, hey, that's just the span of this. Again, the basis for the eigenspace for negative 2 is thus this set here consisting of only that term. And finally, this vector would be an example of an eigenvector for negative 2. I could check that by going through here and saying 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and negative 2 to see if that that's true. Okay, what's the geometric multiplicity? Well, there's only one thing here. Therefore, the geometric multiplicity will be 1 since there's only one element in the basis for the eigenspace. Okay, that's that for this example. So now here, I'm going to go through all of these cases. So yeah, so compute the eigenvectors and eigenvalues for this and plot an ellipse defined by A along with the eigenvectors. Well, we're just going to repeat this whole process that we did over here, but for this. So we first find the characteristic polynomial. So how do we do that? Well, the characteristic polynomial is simply going to be the determinant of a minus lambda times i, this. Okay, this is just this, subtracting the lambdas here, and 2 by 2 determinant, product of that minus that is this. Do some cleanup. Hey, that's 42. If I expand this out, that's what I get. So from here, this is factorable lambda minus 6, lambda plus 7. Okay, so now I have my characteristic polynomial and in a nice form where I can compute the lambdas. So from here, computing the roots gives me 6 for this and negative 7 from here. The algebraic multiplicities for both will just be 1, just as a side note, since the power for each of these terms is just 1. Okay, so how do I find the eigenvectors? Well, I row reduce this to find the null space, right? So from here, if I subtract 6, it's just this, if I row reduce it, you can notice, hey, I could just add these together, divide that by 8, I get this. So one free parameter here, and yeah, so the solution will just be neg or 5 over 8 times t, comma, negative t. I'm sorry, comma t. Apologize for that. Okay, so that's what my solutions look like. Therefore, an eigenvector for 6 is just this. So for this question, I didn't ask for the eigenspace, so yeah. So notice here, I just picked t is equal to 1. You could have picked t is equal to 8 to make this a little bit cleaner, where you'd have 8 and 5. It doesn't matter what the scalar is. They're all eigenvectors for this eigenvalue. Okay, so now I want to do the same thing for negative 7. So I row reduce this thing to find the null space. So it's this or that. Notice here, I could just divide this by 5 and then cancel off the 8. So I get 1, 1, 0, 0. Okay, so from here one free parameter for this, call it t, so I'll get negative t, comma t. Okay, 
pick any value of t. I just picked 1. So if you pick 1, you get this is an eigenvector for negative 7. Okay? That's all there really is to doing this. Characteristic polynomial, find the roots, get the eigenvalues, find these null spaces, pick a value for the free parameter. Ultimately, checking your solutions are good, but I've checked these. They're all good. Okay, so let's visualize the stuff. So the eigenpairs, this is just a fancy way of saying eigenvector, comma, eigenvalue, comma, eigenvector. You don't need to know this terminology. It's just a convenient way of writing this down. Okay, and don't use it on the final or midterm uh, because we're not expecting you to know it. Just, yeah, just write it out long form. Okay, so from here, let's examine what A does to these vectors graphically by normalizing the eigenvectors. So here, this has a link that's different than 1, and it's kind of more useful to see this geometrically what's happening if I pick the eigenvector that has a norm of 1. So I'm just going to normalize these. It's kind of ugly looking, but it's a thing. Okay. So if I do this, here's my unit circle, and on here, my u vector is going to be this eigenvector here. It will point over here once I normalize it, and my v vector will be this eigenvector here, and it will point over here, right? Negative x, positive y. Okay. So if I take an arbitrary vector x, so the thing that I mentioned before, and rewrite this as a linear combination of u and v, because in this case, u and v is a basis, not true in general, but it is a basis for R2 in this case. So now, if I apply A, what happens? Well, my original picture gets modified. My U gets mapped to 6U, so this is not to scale, because otherwise it would be all the way over here. Uh, and my V gets mapped to negative 7 times V, right? That's what it means to be these eigenvalues, eigenvectors. I just scale by lambda. So how does x change? Well, I wrote it down earlier. This x will change simply to be ax would be 6c1u, right? The eigenvalue uh, times the eigenvector is just a times the eigenvector, and negative 7 times this thing. So here I can just compute x by computing this linear combination over here. Okay, so that's quite useful. And now I can draw this uh, ellipse that I would get here by just taking A and applying it to all of the vectors on the unit circle. You've seen this before. And the area of this ellipse will just be the determinant times the area of this circle. Why? Well, let's just think of a simpler case. So here, if I drew this parallelogram, the sides have length 1, so the area would be 1. Here, this parallelogram would have sides 6 and 7. The area would be 6 times 7, so that is just the product of the eigenvalues, right? It's lambda 1 times lambda 2, but that's the same thing as the determinant of A. So from here, from this idea that the determinant is the product of the eigenvalues, you can see that, in fact, the determinant, or the absolute value of the determinant, because some of these eigenvalues could be negative, in particular, this one's negative, but that length is not negative, uh, but from here, you can see why that formula should work. And formally speaking, you can prove that formula by using this, at least in the situation where the eigenvalues form a basis. Okay, so this is some of the geometric stuff that's happening here. And yeah, it's not overtly complex, but it's quite useful. Okay, let's talk about much more complicated examples that we ultimately will not be able to discuss everything of because it is well beyond the scope of the class. But in the real world, here's some places where you can use eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So the probability of an electron being in any particular given location uh, is given by a normalized solution to this Schrodinger equation. Okay, so what's really happening here? So I have a proton that has a positive charge sitting here or some other configuration potentially. So just sticking with the single proton, because it's easier. So I have an electron that has a negative charge. It has a probability of being in various locations in space. That probability is modeled by, well, that probability is given by this uh, psi, or a modificated, or modified version of psi. And that psi has to solve this equation. I know it looks complex, but it's not overly complex. Let's break it down. I is just the imaginary unit for this thing. H is just the reduced Planck constant. This is just a number. 
So this thing is a number times i. This thing, that is just acting like the derivative with respect to x. You'll learn about, you should learn about partial derivatives next term, depending on your cohort. You may or may not, but this is just the derivative with respect to x. So this is saying the change in time of the probability it mul multiplied by this thing is equal to the stuff over here. Well, what's the stuff over here? Well, I know this is just a number, so what's the n? Well, before I go to that, this thing is just a differential operator. So in the case where I deal on a single line, this nabla quantity squared, this thing is just the derivative, the second derivative in particular. Okay, so it's not too unfamiliar, but if you wanna actually find the atomic orbitals, you have to write this in a different coordinate system. So I left it as nabla. I don't wanna lie to you and tell you an equation that's not true. Okay, so from here, what's m? Well, m is just the mass of the particle. So this is just a number times something that looks like the second derivative plus this thing here, that's just a potential function. So here, this should be no time if you assume it doesn't change with time. What's the potential function? Well, that is describing the physical situation with the plus stuff. So here, if I just have a single plus, the potential might look something like this with it dropping to zero. Could look something like that. Okay, so it's just a function. Okay, so given this little complex thing here that we can't fully explain at this point in this course, you could cover it in an ODE or PDE course. Let's kind of break it down a little bit. I want solutions to this, right? If I know what this thing looks like, I know what the probability of finding an electron is, and that can let me define the atomic orbitals, right? Atomic orbitals are probability curves for the probability of finding an electron within that curve. Okay, so here, if this thing represents a single point charge, this thing, then you can find solutions to this by looking for things of this form. So I'm not going to discuss this here, but I will discuss it in one of the future examples. Uh, but if you look for things of this form and you plug this into this equation for here and here, you can simplify this to a simpler equation. Notice this is just all of the stuff over here. And this is just lambda. Okay. It turns out this thing is what's called a linear operator. It's kind of a generalized idea of a linear transform. This is an eigenvalue, right? Or it's just a number. It turns out that it's gonna be an eigenvalue because this is linear operator times x is equal to lambda times x. You can write this with arbitrary accuracy and appropriate boundary condition to be exactly equal to a matrix, an n by n matrix, acting on f is equal to lambda times f. This is an honest to God eigenvalue problem. So is this, but it's not an eigenvalue problem in terms of matrices. It's in terms of this weird operator here. It's not really weird, but it's in terms of this operator here. Okay, and here, what's this lambda? This, or sorry, uh, this lambda is an eigenvalue and this f is just gonna be a vector. Okay, well, the lambda could be anything, but you really want it to be the eigenvalues. So from here, if you find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, that tells you these probability curves or the spatial structure of them, what it looks like in space. And the lambda tells you ultimately the amount of energy that's kind of held within that orbital. Okay, so here solving this in spherical coordinates. So basically uh, you kind of say, hey, I have a distance from here. I have an angle in the xy plane right? I can talk about angle here, but I also have an angle in the uh, z plane. So two angles and a distance that ultimately gives you three wave numbers here. So basically your lambda is going to be some function of n, m, and l. Okay. So you get your eigenvalues that look like this. So if you change values of n, m, and l, you get a different eigenvalue, a different spectral frequency, if you will, and that will give you a different orbital. So here, if you chase this out, if m, n, and l are all zero, you get this s orbital here. And if you allow l to be one and change, it, or n to be one and change m and l, you can get these three orbitals here and you can keep going. So these atomic orbitals are going to be the eigenfunctions of that uh, Schrodinger operator. And the energies that's required to go from one orbital to the next orbital, 
this is related to the eigenvalues. Okay, so beyond the scope of the class, but definitely interesting. Atomic orbitals are important. If they didn't exist or had different structures, reality would be completely different. Okay, next let's talk about the eigenmodes of a vibrating plate. Okay, so the vibrations of a vibrating plate cab can be described by this PDE here. Okay, so what's really this saying? Well, if U is the position of the particle, so here, if you, or the plate, if U is the position of the plate, this is the second derivative of U. This is the acceleration. And I know F is equal to M times A, right? Oops. And, yep, sorry. Put the M over here, the F over here. Okay, so you can divide this by M, and this thing is essentially the force divided by the mass. Okay, so F is equal to MA gives me this equation here that can describe how a plate vibrates. Okay, well, how does that help me? Well, oh, yeah, sorry, here K is a constant, and this thing is the same operator that we had before. Okay, so from here, I could find solutions in this form. So let's actually chase this out a little bit. It's way beyond the scope of the class, but it's not too bad. So T only depends on T. So I could take out, when I compute this derivative, I'm just going to get this for the left-hand side. So I'll get this is equal to k. Nabla, well, this thing only acts on x. t doesn't depend on x. So I can pull it outside, just like you can take a constant out of the derivative. And this would simply be this times nabla squared acting on x. Okay. So you can divide both of these sides by x times t, assuming it's not 0, which is an assumption you can make here. This gives me this thing is equal to k times my nabla squared acting on x, all divided by x, right? The x's cancel here, the t's cancel here. Okay, this only depends on time. This only depends on space. If they're, yeah, since this only depends on time and this only depends on space, they both have to be constants. Otherwise, like, this can't be true because if one varies on, if one changes with respect to time, then yeah, you're kind of, this equation can't be true. Using this, that's how I get this equation. Here I have this thing is true, multiply by x, that gives me this. Here I dropped the k, uh, but for here it's really that's the demonstration that matters. Okay, so given this vibrating plate, I can find, uh, I can rewrite the spatial structure as an eigenvalue problem. So here if I solve this, with appropriate boundary conditions, I can rewrite it as this. Okay, so A is a matrix that represents this again. Lambda is just lambda, and F is kind of a vector representation of this function. Okay, so if I can solve this, I can figure out what the shape of the vibrating modes is going to be. Okay, uh, just writing that down. Yeah, I can value problem. So just one thing before I get started. To be exactly accurate, this is not how you would describe the real vibrations of a metal plate. You would have something that's not linear, but it can be approximated by this. And you can, uh, knowing how the spatial structure here, or sorry, the temporal structure here acts, you could figure out which one of these modes you're actually going to physically see in action. So there's a much more complex problem called a linear stability problem overlying this thing. And I just wanted to mention it here since I have infinite time in a video. Okay, so from here, in general, there's going to be infinitely many but discrete eigenvalues. What do I mean by discrete? They're going to act like the first one, the second one, the third one. Okay, so this will be true if the domain's finite. It's, it is for a finite plate like this. Okay, so from here, these physically represent the frequencies at which, well, these are the frequencies at which you could vibrate the plate. And the corresponding x's are the shapes of the vibration. So let's just look at this as a like actual video. So if I open up this guy over here and mute it so I can hear myself think. Uh, so from here, if I vibrate this plate at different frequencies, so here I'm just vibrating it by vibrating in the middle, I get these different shapes that appear. Okay, so what's happening here? Well, the sand that's on the plate, when it vibrates, gets knocked up and down and that'll cause it to move to the left or to the right until it's no longer being pushed up or down. So these curves that you see here, these are where I have a zero of those uh, 
vibrations. So if I take that function x, these curves are going to be the zeros of that function x. And there's infinitely many of these. If I take, take a different eigenvalue, a different frequency, and vibrate it at that frequency and turn it on, eventually all these little particles get pushed off to this little edge. So you can keep doing this. There's, yeah, you can kind of see all the little structures here. There's infinitely many of these and they get more and more complicated as you go to higher and higher frequencies. This is generally true. It was true for the electron stuff we talked about. It's true here. Okay, so next example, bridge. Well, a bridge can be described roughly by this PDE. Again, you technically have a nonlinear problem over here. Nonlinear, that's big, bad, and awful. But you can do this linear stability theory to get this to describe the modes that will grow in time. Grow exponentially in time, which is a really bad thing if you're a bridge. So here, this is representing the position of the bridge. It's really the same equation we had before, right? K is a constant, and this is the same operator that I had previous, Lee. So here, doing the same process, I can rewrite, so or I can find solutions in this form, and I can uh, note that my x would satisfy this, where again, I drop the k, but it doesn't matter so much for this demonstration. So with this, you can say, hey, with the appropriate boundary conditions, namely what happens at the edge of the bridge, we can approximate this by this thing to any desired accuracy. Again, A is a discretized version of this, lambda is the same lambda, and F is a discretized version of this function. Okay, so this is a matrix, that's a vector. This is an eigenvalue problem. So from here, uh, again, there's infinitely many values of these eigenvalues for a bit bridge of finite length, and these uh, physically represent vibrational frequencies. So. If for any of these resonant frequencies lambda, any of these eigenvalues for the bridge, if this can be met physically, say by wind blowing on the bridge at the right speed, then energy will be pumped into the bridge, and the shape that's going to come out will be that or will be given by that eigenfunction. Okay, so it'll start to oscillate with this shape, and those oscillations will keep building up, right? Because if you want to think of it like this, over time, like as time goes by, I'm applying this operator repeatedly. So I'm taking A times my, whatever my sh current shape of the bridge is. This is going to be the shape of the bridge in the future. And what's going to happen is I'm ultimately going to say, as time goes off to infinity, this thing approximately will look like lambda to the n times f, okay? This thing gets bigger. This means the oscillations get bigger and bigger. Energy pumps into the bridge. That's not a good thing. If you put too much energy into the bridge and you're doing these oscillations, that's putting stresses and strains on the bridge, kind of like imagine taking a piece of plastic and bending it back and forth faster and faster, stronger and stronger. It's going to rip eventually. This can happen in the real world, and it did. So if you look at the Tokakoma Bridge, here you have these, I'll just pause at the good picture, if I go back. So here you have these oscillations, this structure of the bending and twisting, this is given by that function x. So x of say y comma z, where y and z are the directions along the bridge. So if I kind of put coordinates, one coordinate, say, going this way and the other one going perpendicular to it. So if you, on any of these coordinates, the value of x tells me the height of this bridge. Okay, so the structure of this is just given by x, and the wind, the thing that's causing this, the wind is blowing in on this at a value of, I believe, 35 miles per hour which corresponds roughly to one of those lambdas. Like, you can satisfy this. It doesn't necessarily have to directly correspond to it. That's a whole nother topic entirely, but for this discussion, it roughly does. So here, these vibrations we get, the time component is that t of t lambda, the second function. So if I go back over to here, the... Uh, structure is given by this thing and how it changes over time is given by this function here. So since the wind is still blowing, this function has an amplitude that increases over time 
that's why the bridge started from no oscillations to bigger, like small, bigger, bigger, bigger. It's resonating to vibrate more and more. So what happens is bridges aren't designed to do this, right? Like if your bridge is doing this, you're doing something wrong. So what happens is eventually the strength of the bridge can no longer contend with the amount of power going into this oscillation and the oscillations tear the bridge apart. So this is kind of analogous to if you can scream at the right frequency with enough intensity, you can shatter a wine glass or you can do it to say an eyeball or any physical object has resonant frequencies, you can make it do this if you put energy in at the right rate. Okay, so that is another application of an eigenvalue problem to the real world. Again, beyond the scope of the class, but not so much. You just need to understand these things and a little bit of how linear algebra generalizes to infinite dimensional things. So basically R infinity to R infinity instead of R n to R n. But with a little bit of information, you can discuss this and it's not too bad. Okay. So beyond here, I do recommend looking at the tutorial assignments, and here is your meme to end this tutorial. So I hope you enjoyed the applications. Hopefully someone actually watches it. Uh, you can let me know if you did. Uh, but yeah, this is one of the things that I've spent a lot of my time doing as a researcher, right? Like my project for my master's thesis and my PhD thesis all involves linear stability problems, which all involve solving these eigenvalues. So actually, to end with something a bit more complex, let me pause this for a second. Okay, this is my thesis. So here, these equations are the equations that I want to solve to see how a jet propagates over time or to see what happens with it. Okay, again, complicated, but notice this nabla and nabla squared appear here. They appear in a lot of equations. Okay, so this thing is what's called not linear. So these terms keep it from having the property that a of x plus y is equal to a of x plus a of y. This is not true. So what you do is you turn this into a linear equation by making some assumptions and doing some stuff. And I'll skip over till I get to it. And when you do it, you can say, hey, the vibrational frequencies or the structure that you'll see when things go unstable will be given by solutions to this equation. So then what you do is you say, oh, I'm going to assume that it kind of grows like this. Hey, look, it's complex numbers. They're quite useful. Uh, and if you make this assumption about the governing equations over here after you linearize it, you can then rewrite this as an eigenvalue problem. So this is just doing the work in the background just to show you how much work you can get. So this, this thing is an eigenvalue. This is multiplied by a matrix times a vector. Here's another big matrix times a vector. So this looks like omega a v is equal to b v. Okay, so kind of formally speaking, if you invert the a and put it over here, you get an eigenvalue problem. But it's sometimes useful to put an eigenvalue problem in this form, and it is here. It's called a generalized eigenvalue problem. So if you find solutions to this, then you have the structure that the jet will have when it goes unstable. So how do you find solutions? Well, you do a lot of work and you can approximate this by a uh, standard matrix that you've seen. These are big matrices. In particular, this is what A looks like. The little dots here are locations where the value is non-zero and all this white space is where it's zero. So this is a big matrix. So if this is equal to this is equal to 32, this matrix will be four times 32 squared minus uh, two. So this is kind of small in terms of what I was actually solving, but it's still a massive matrix. Okay, so now after I solve this, what happens? Well, here's a picture. These contours, the lines that I drew in here, are the values that came from my theoretical solver. So my solver predicted that when this jet starts to go unstable and uh, like an El Nimo event or that type of thing happens, the structure will be given by these contours. The colors here, the colors that you see, those are given by just simply taking the jet and running it through a very accurate numerical simulation. So here you can see that the colors, like the flat lines here, match very well with the contours of the colors. 
So in fact, if you actually, if I go over here, so in fact, if you chase this out, this uh, line here is what's predicted by the pure theory. And this is what actually happens when you just run a random code. Uh, the blue line doesn't quite equal the green line. That's to be expected. That's just kind of numerical stuff. So here you can see it matches really, really well. And this is when I kind of forced it to be in a situation where it matched. So yeah, these are definitely applicable. Uh, yeah, they're definitely very useful. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed and have a wonderful weekend and I'll talk to you next week.